I don't know about you, but I, along with many of my friends, often joke about wanting to find a sugar daddy to pay for all my stuff and send me on nice vacations and all of that. But obviously, most of us are joking. I know I am. I enjoy being an independent lady who doesn't rely on a single person to fund my life. However, there are still so many women out there whose lives are completely funded by older men who like to provide a life of luxury to younger women. Sometimes there is a sexual relationship. Sometimes it's a fully transactional relationship. Sometimes there may even be a real connection between the two. If you're in any of these situations, more power to you. But with Kelsey Turner, she fully sunk her claws in and wouldn't let go until she got everything she possibly could out of her sugar daddy. And when he threatened to cut her off, things took a devastating turn for the worst. This is the tragic case of Thomas Burchard. 71-year-old Thomas Burchard was originally from Boston, Massachusetts before he and his family moved to Virginia, where his father started to work as the dean of Virginia Tech's College of Architecture and Urban Studies. Thomas was always known to be very motivated and driven, and that was clear in his career choice. Thomas went to medical school to become a doctor, and while in school, he realized that he wanted to become a child psychiatrist. He ended up doing some of his residencies at some of the top colleges in the country, such as Cincinnati Children's Hospital, UCLA, and the Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula in California, where he would ultimately end up working and where he spent 40 years of his career. Thomas never went on to have children of his own, but he was known to love children. Children. He was passionate about his job as a child psychiatrist, and he was good at it too. He was a part of the Los Angeles's Magic Castle, which is a club of pro-level magicians and illusionists. Thomas took his skills to work, impressing the children he worked with with magic tricks and illusions. Back in the early 2000s, Thomas met a woman named Judy Earp, who was 12 years younger than him and had four children of her own. Both Thomas and Judy previously had been married, but of course, they were single when they met. The two met through mutual friends while they were on a trip to Vegas together. These two were the only people in the group who didn't drink or gamble, so the two ended up spending a lot of time hanging out by the pool together, having conversations, and just enjoying each other's company. That is how the two got to know each other. After meeting and starting a relationship, Judy moved to Salinas, California into Thomas's home in the country to live with him. There, they shared the home with three of Judy's children. They raised goats together, horses, mini pigs, donkeys, and chickens. They were living a simple life while Thomas worked as a doctor and Judy worked as a real estate agent. According to Judy, Thomas was one of the most generous men that you could meet. He had a lot of money, but he hardly ever spent any money on himself. He was always buying things for her and her children and even spending money to help out many of his patients anytime they were in need. Particularly, Thomas had a soft side for helping women who were down on their luck homeless women or women on the verge of homelessness, drug addicts, or sex workers. He wanted to help these women turn their lives around and make something of themselves. That leads me to introducing 25-year-old Kelsey Turner. Kelsey Turner was born in Norfolk, Virginia before her family moved to Jonesboro, Arkansas, where she grew up. Kelsey went on to attend Arkansas State University. However, during that time, Kelsey was recognized for her natural beauty and her ability to pose for the camera. So she started modeling for lingerie and swimsuit shots for different racy magazines. While doing this work, Kelsey moved away from her hometown in Arkansas and moved to California, where the opportunities were more plentiful. From there, Kelsey worked her way up in the industry, going on to work as a model for magazines such as Maximum, Players Magazine, Fire and Ice, and even Playboy Magazine. During this time, she started gaining some traction in the modeling world, landing her appearances in movies such as The Promise in 2011, as well as Wally Got Wasted in 2018. Kelsey would later describe herself as being impulsive. She loved thrills and having fun. She said that she knew she only had one life to live, so she was going to live it to its fullest. 
She went on to say that she was just a Russian-American blonde trying to change the world. On Instagram, she can be seen posing in various suggestive positions in swimsuits and other revealing clothing. She also posted herself on magazine covers as well as with her friends on fun nights out. She was clearly a confident young woman who loved to show off what she had to offer. Nothing wrong with that. It is believed that it was some time back in 2017 when Thomas met Kelsey online. According to Judy, she doesn't know exactly how the two met, but we found out from past divorce papers from Thomas's first marriage that he did have a history of meeting beautiful women online who had suggestive screen names. Sometimes he would meet these women in person, sometimes they were just online relationships. While Thomas always claimed that none of these relationships were romantic or sexual, we don't know the full story. We do know that Thomas liked to send these women money, but he said that he just liked helping people out. As you could probably guess, Thomas's ex-wife did not believe him, hence why it was listed in their divorce papers, but Judy didn't seem to mind. Now, I do want to note that there are some men out there who get gratification out of sending pretty women money, whether they get sexual gratification from the act of sending money or they just enjoy sending money. There are men out there who will send money without any sexual favors in return, but it is still a sexual thing for some of these men. So, if that makes sense, some of these men will send money and get sexual gratification just from the act of that, so these women don't actually have to, like, do any sexual favors or, you know, exchange sexual messages and things like that. Some men just enjoy sending money, while others do get sexual gratification out of it. So, I don't want to sit here and say that I know Thomas better than Judy, the person who knew him best. I don't want to say that I know his motives or anything like that, but I do just want to point out that it is always a bit strange when these men are over here sending these young, beautiful women money for no reason. I'll just put it that way. Either way, from how Judy understood the situation, when Thomas met Kelsey, he was under the impression that Kelsey was the single mother of two children, she had nowhere to live, and she couldn't qualify for a lease to rent a house. Because of that, Thomas offered to sign a lease for her to live in a house in Salinas, California with her mother and children. But he ended up paying for her rent altogether, which cost him $3,200 a month. After that, this progressed into him helping her buy a BMW by signing the loan for the car, but once again, he ended up paying for the entire car by himself. It was said that through all of the different women that Thomas had financially supported throughout his life, none of them had a hold on him like Kelsey did. He was constantly sending her money, and no matter what Kelsey did, it seemed like Thomas was addicted to her attention. She would message him all of the time asking for money for rent, prescription, drugs, and things like that. She would message him and be like, where are you? I need money for this right now. You better get over here. If you want my love, you better get over here. Over the course of them knowing each other for about a year and a half, he spent a total of $500,000 on her. The way that this relationship progressed was something that Judy was not happy with. She knew all about Kelsey, but she did not like him spending all of that money on her. In fact, Judy referred to Kelsey as a white trash whore. Judy was pretty much always encouraging Thomas to cut Kelsey off, and after some time, after realizing how Kelsey was treating him, he was leaning towards the idea of stopping his payments to Kelsey. When Kelsey caught wind of Thomas possibly trying to cut her off, Kelsey started to get pissed. She knew that it was mostly Judy who was behind the idea, and she started to say that Judy was on her shit list, and if she ever got her evicted, that she'd kill her. Then, that turned into threats against Thomas himself. According to what Judy would later tell police, Kelsey started to threaten Thomas that she would go to the police with accusations that could ruin his career working with children. According to Judy, Kelsey made allegations that he was inappropriate towards children. However, these allegations were completely unfounded. Nothing of the sort was ever found in his phone or records or anything like that. 
So it really just seemed like an empty threat made by Kelsey to hopefully get him so afraid that he would continue paying her rent and her car payments. And it seemed to work for at least a while because no matter how baseless these threats seemed, Thomas didn't feel comfortable going to the police, which I can totally understand if you know that you're not guilty of something, but you are afraid that, you know, maybe Kelsey told some people to go forward with false stories, or maybe Kelsey's gonna claim that she saw something that she didn't actually see. It can be hard for him to dismantle any false allegations without any proof, and I can see why he wouldn't want to go to the police with fear that he may be going to jail for something that he genuinely did not do. By the end of 2018, almost two years into knowing Thomas, he finally kicked Kelsey out of the house that she was renting in California and took away her BMW. After that, Kelsey decided to move to Las Vegas, Nevada with her then four-year-old son. I will note now that she had custody of the four-year-old, but she did have another son who she did not have custody of. Now, both Thomas and Judy seemed happy with the fact that they were no longer going to have to deal with Kelsey, especially with her living so close to them. So, Judy suggested that Thomas help fund her move, so he did just that. By early in 2019, Kelsey arrived to her new home in Vegas. There, she lived in a four-bedroom home with her four-year-old son and several roommates. After she moved, Thomas cut her off and tried to stop all contact with her. He said that he would no longer be supporting her and her child, that she needed to figure things out on her own. However, after settling into her new home in Vegas, she sunk her claws right back into him. By March of 2019, she told Thomas that she was sick and could no longer work, so she wasn't able to afford to take care of her son. It was also reported that Kelsey told Thomas that her boyfriend at the time had been physically abusing her. So, she was using whatever she could to get sympathy from him and to get more and more money from him. So, eventually, he did start paying for the rent for her new four-bedroom home, and bought her a new Mercedes to replace the BMW that he took away. Now, this next part is reported differently depending on what source you look at. Some reports say that Kelsey was keeping Thomas in the dark about a lot of things and was lying a lot, so he got suspicious of her and wanted to see her in person to figure out what was going on. Other reports say that he felt bad for her situation and wanted to visit her. Either way, Thomas booked a ticket and flew over from California to Las Vegas, Nevada to visit Kelsey, arriving to her two-story suburban home on March 1st, 2019. When Thomas arrived, he was met with a very full house. He actually had no idea that Kelsey lived with people, but again, she had multiple roommates. Kelsey lived in the master bedroom on the second floor with her then 27-year-old boyfriend, John Kennison. Next to her room on the second floor lived her son in his room, and then in another bedroom on the second floor was one of her other roommates, a 30-year-old woman named Deanna Pena. Then, Kelsey had a fourth roommate, Jeremy Eskridge, who slept downstairs on the first floor. During Thomas's stay, apparently a friend of Kelsey's took her son and babysat him for a few days so that he would be out of the house for that that time. Then, to sort of talk about the dynamics between the roommates for a second. Like I said, Deanna was a little bit older than Kelsey and the others, and it was said that she was living at the house for free because she acted as a part-time nanny for Kelsey's son. And again, Kelsey was pretty much paying the rent because Thomas was giving her the money for it. She was probably making money from the other roommates to live there while she pocketed it, not actually paying the rent because, again, she was being given all the money for the rent. Either way, Deanna worked as a bartender at the Coliseum Theater at Caesars Palace, and again, when she wasn't working nights, during the day, she helped watch Kelsey's son. Meanwhile, John was a former gang member who was known to use drugs in his past, but I'm not exactly sure how he met Kelsey or even how long they had been dating. While there, Thomas stayed in communication with his girlfriend back home, Judy. By March 2nd, he texted that everything was okay but apparently there was a bit of an incident that day. 
This next part comes from one of Kelsey's roommates, Jeremy. On the evening of March 2nd, it was said that Jeremy's girlfriend, a woman named Chelsea, who was also a beautiful young blonde woman, showed up to the house drunk. When she got there, she struck up a conversation with Thomas, which apparently Kelsey was not happy about. Then Thomas offered to take Chelsea to the store, driving Kelsey's car, which was a blue Mercedes. This made Kelsey even more upset. Once they left, Kelsey and her boyfriend, John, burst into Jeremy's room and started screaming at him, saying that Chelsea was trying to take Thomas away from her and demanding that Jeremy go get Chelsea and bring Thomas back. But by the time Jeremy went outside, Chelsea and Thomas had already left. But when Jeremy tried going back inside, apparently John stopped Jeremy from getting back in the house, shoving him back outside, and then punching him in the face. According to Jeremy, John started making some vague threats towards him, saying things like, you better find out where they were going or something bad is going to happen to you, and things like that. At the time, Jeremy didn't take it seriously. It seems to me that maybe John was the type of person who flew off the handle frequently and said things like that often because this was such a small thing that he was punching someone in the face over, so it seems like maybe that was just in his character. By the time, Thomas and Chelsea got back to the house. Jeremy had been waiting for her outside and the two of them left in a taxi and according to them, they did not return back to the house for four days. Now, like I said, Judy had been staying in contact with Thomas while he was in Vegas. However, after March 2nd, she hadn't heard anything from him. By that day, Thomas had expressed to Judy how excited he was to return back to California and be done with this whole ordeal. His flight back home was scheduled for March 4th, but that day it came and went and he never returned home. Around that time, Judy also started receiving text messages from Thomas's phone, but the way they sounded did not sound like Thomas. These were messages that were trying to get information on her bank accounts, but he should have already known that information, so Judy was very suspicious. She tried calling him multiple times, but each time, the call was always going to voicemail. Now, according to Judy, Thomas had been struggling with dementia in the weeks before his death, getting lost in grocery store parking lots, getting lost in crowds, and forgetting things that he normally would never forget. So, Judy was worried that Thomas forgot his flight or that maybe something happened to him. She wondered if maybe he got lost somewhere. Given that this was somewhere he was unfamiliar with, it would be pretty dangerous for him if he got lost. So, Judy did contact police after a day or so of not hearing him, and they did attempt to make contact, but they weren't able to get a hold of him. But after not returning from his flight, that is when police took the situation a lot more seriously. By March 5th, police went to Kelsey's home to do a welfare check, but they didn't get an answer at the door and they couldn't gain entry, so they left for the time being. By the following day, March 6th, Jeremy returned back to the house to get some of his belongings, but when he got there, he couldn't enter the house because it was locked. At that point, he sat outside of the house waiting for a bit to try and figure out how he was going to get inside. But while there, police showed back up to conduct another welfare check for Thomas. When speaking with police, Jeremy did confirm that Thomas was at the house in the previous days. But at the time, Jeremy had no idea where everyone was or what could have happened. Once again, police had no way of entering the home at that time, so they left. After speaking with police, Jeremy contacted Kelsey and asked to get the garage opener from John so he could get inside. He went and got the garage opener and made access into the home. At that point, he noticed that there was a strong smell of cleaning supplies and noticed right away that the entire home had been cleaned. That was very unusual because he said that the house was usually pretty dirty and no one really cleaned around the place. He then went upstairs and noticed that one of the doors to the bedrooms was broken. Jeremy contacted Kelsey again, asking her if she could fix the door because he assumed that it was her who did it and it was her son's room. 
and she replied saying that he could use Thomas's credit card to buy a new door. This really weirded Jeremy out, saying that he wasn't about to use someone else's credit card information to start buying things. That made him way too uncomfortable. At that time, Jeremy was convinced that something weird was going on. It was very strange to him that everyone had cleaned the house so well and then everyone just left and were not coming back. Days passed without much happening in the case with Judy still not hearing from Thomas and Jeremy having no idea where anyone in that house went. However, by March 7th, 911 received a call to report a suspicious vehicle abandoned on a dirt road about two miles off the highway, about 20 miles northeast of the Las Vegas Strip. This vehicle turned out to be Kelsey's 2017 Mercedes-Benz. When they got there, the car's two front windows were rolled down. In the front passenger seat of the car, they saw that there were several pairs of latex gloves and there were burn marks throughout the front seat, which suggested to police that there was a small fire in the car. They also noticed stains that appeared to be blood stains on the driver's seat headrest as well as in the back seat. Because the windows were down, officers gained access pretty easily and they were able to turn the car on and open the trunk. Upon opening the trunk, they found a pile of clothing and blankets, but from that there was a foul odor emanating. So they moved the blankets and under the pile, they found a human body and next to the body, there was a baseball bat. Of course, after seeing all of this evidence in the car and finding a body, the body was removed and sent off to the medical examiner, and the car was towed and transferred for further forensic examination. When the body was found, there was actually a wallet that contained several debit cards as well as an ID, so using that, the body was ultimately identified as belonging to 71-year-old Thomas Burchard. It was found that Thomas appeared to have suffered from blunt force trauma to his head after being struck with an unknown object multiple times. He had bruises, cuts, scratches, and scrapes all over his face, neck, back, and chest. Even part of his ear was missing. There were also defensive wounds all over Thomas's body, which said that he tried fighting off his attacker. His manner of death was determined to be the result of homicidal violence due to blunt force trauma to his head. With the Mercedes back in the forensics lab, they were able to find further evidence. In the car, they found several prints, DNA, those blue latex gloves with blood on them, clothing with blood on them, Thomas's vest that he had been wearing, as well as his house keys. There were also several cleaning supplies in the car, along with evidence of an attempted cleanup. Based on the blood evidence they found, it appeared that Thomas was attacked in the back seat of the car and then moved to the trunk via the passenger side door. Of course, given the fact that Thomas was last known to be at Kelsey's house and now her body was found in his car, it doesn't take a genius to make that connection and think that maybe Kelsey had something to do with his murder. By March 8th, police were able to obtain a search warrant for Kelsey's home and executed it that same day. In the home, first, police found a pile of laundry which contained blue and white striped towels that matched some of the towels found in the car. Upstairs, again, they found that one of the bedroom doors had been damaged. It looked like it had literally been ripped off of the hinges and then broken into two pieces. Upon looking further at the door, they found blood on both halves. When looking in the garage, officers found blood, shoe prints, cleaning supplies, and signs of an attempted cleanup. According to officers, there were swirl marks all over the floors, indicative of somebody trying to clean the place up with a towel. After seeing all of this evidence, it was clear that Kelsey, or at least somebody in that house, had something to do with Thomas's murder. But nobody in that house, except for Jeremy, like I mentioned earlier, 
could be located. To locate Kelsey, police were able to get a warrant to look at her cell phone records. Turns out that after police showed up on March 6th and Jeremy asked John for the garage opener, they also found out that police had paid the house a visit. This freaked Kelsey out, so her, Deanna, as well as Kelsey's son, all stayed at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Vegas for a day. Now, while at the Mandalay Bay, according to what Deanna would later tell police, at the time, Kelsey still had her blue Mercedes. But on March 6th, after hearing that police visited the house, Kelsey drove off with the car and Deanna never saw it again. Then police found out that on that same day, March 6th, Kelsey hired a cleaning service to clean the house. Kelsey told the cleaning crew that they had thrown a party, which got out of hand. There were red stains all over the place, but Kelsey assured the cleaners that it was red wine. The cleaners also noticed the busted door, and Kelsey told them that someone had locked themselves in that room, and there were bunk beds in the room, and I guess the person was drunk, so they were afraid of the person hurting themselves or something like that, so they busted in. That was the story they gave the cleaning crew. The cleaning crew did their best and cleaned the house before leaving. According to cell phone records, in the early morning hours of March 6th, Kelsey's phone also pinged in the area near Lake Mead, which is right near where Thomas's body was found in the trunk of her car. After the home was cleaned, by March 7th, Kelsey, her son, and Deanna moved to the Rio Hotel in Vegas. By that point, the news came out to the public regarding Thomas's murder, so according to police, Kelsey turned her phone off and it was never turned back on. Using the cell phone records, police did follow up to see if she was still at the Rio Hotel, but she wasn't. When they got to her room though, they knew that she had just been there. It was clear that she left in a hurry, leaving her fingerprints behind as well as several personal items that belonged to both Kelsey and Deanna. By March 13th, after still being unable to locate her, Las Vegas police did issue a warrant for her arrest. Because she was originally from California, that is where police believed she was headed. So, Vegas officers worked with the task force in Stockton, California to locate Kelsey. A few weeks later, they were able to locate her and they finally arrested her. A few weeks after finding Kelsey, police were also able to locate her boyfriend, John Kennison, and take him in as well. Then, after learning of the arrests of Kelsey and John, Deanna Pena turned herself in, showing up to the police station alongside her lawyer. At this point, Deanna Pena told officers that she was ready to tell them everything she knew. As I stated before, the whole situation starts on March 2nd, 2019, the day after Thomas arrived to Kelsey's house. Like I said, Kelsey was really upset at Thomas and Chelsea for going off to the store in her car. When they got back, Chelsea and her boyfriend Jeremy left the house and did not come back for several days. Well, according to Deanna, after Thomas returned back to the house, Deanna asked Kelsey for a ride home from work. So, Thomas drove the car with Kelsey in the passenger seat and went to pick Deanna up. After picking up Deanna, Thomas got a little bit lost, so Kelsey went on his phone to use the GPS. At that point, Kelsey went through Thomas's phone and found text messages between Thomas and Kelsey's mother. In some reports, Deanna told the police that the messages were discussing Kelsey's ability as a mother, discussing possibly having her young children taken away from her. Other reports say that Kelsey found pornographic images sent back and forth between them. After finding the messages, Kelsey threatened to report Thomas to his hospital for having explicit images of children if he didn't pay her money meaning that he would obviously lose his job. Now, like I mentioned earlier, some of the allegations that Kelsey made were that Thomas had these explicit photos of children on his phone. These allegations were never confirmed and Deanna said that she didn't see anything like that on his phone. But either way, while Kelsey was yelling at Thomas, he seemed genuinely confused and he said that he didn't know why Kelsey was acting so crazy. Again, just to clarify, there was an investigation done into these allegations and they were unfounded. So I do not believe that Thomas had these images on his phone whatsoever. There might've been other explicit images of 
grown women and maybe Thomas and Kelsey's mother were sending images back and forth and that made her upset. But either way, there was nothing involving children on his phone. Now, Kelsey yelling at Thomas like that caused Thomas to want to remove himself from the situation. So once they got home, he went upstairs and locked himself in Kelsey's son's bedroom, slamming the door behind him. Once again, as a reminder, Kelsey's four-year-old was not home at the time he was staying with a friend. Deanna described that everything that happened next happened so fast, saying that after Thomas went and locked himself in the room, John, Kelsey's boyfriend, followed him upstairs, kicked down the door, and barged in, yielding a baseball bat. She heard as John then wrestled Thomas to the ground before seeing the bat go into the air. So what I'm picturing is you could probably see like the stairs that go up to the room. There might have been like a balcony with like the railings where you could kind of see what's happening in the room, but you're not like right there. So you can just see the bat going up and not actually see the actual beating that was happening. But as that was happening, Deanna was screaming for them to stop before she ran upstairs to see what was going on. And that is when she found Thomas lying on the ground with a large reddish purple bump on his head. She didn't physically see John hit Thomas, but it was clear what happened. She said that she grabbed the bat from John, who then ran downstairs and sat with Kelsey. Deanna then went over and got Thomas a glass of water. Thomas was still alive, but he knew at that time that he needed to get to a hospital. So, Deanna helped him off the floor and got him down the stairs of the house. At that time, he told Kelsey, John, and Deanna that he didn't want to get anybody in trouble. He told them that he was going to tell the hospital staff that he was mugged by some random assailant. He then got in the car with Deanna's help, and the two sat in the back seat. Once in the garage, Kelsey and John said that they needed to grab Thomas's jacket, so they went back in the house to grab it. In the car, though, Thomas was terrified. He whispered to Deanna that he was scared Kelsey and John were going to kill him, but Deanna didn't believe that. She assured him that he was going to be okay. After going inside and getting the jackets, though, Kelsey came back out to the garage and told Thomas and Deanna that they wanted to clean the house before they went to the hospital. She said the house was a mess, there were clothes everywhere, and there was blood everywhere. So she wanted things to be straightened up first and then promised that she would drive Thomas to the hospital. Deanna then went inside to help clean. She stripped the bed that Thomas had been sleeping in and started cleaning the blood off of the linens. Again, this all happened in that room, so there was blood pretty much everywhere from being hit in the head. As Deanna was upstairs cleaning, Thomas remained in the garage, refusing to come back in the house. Then inside the house, Deanna heard an argument between John and Kelsey. Kelsey started yelling at John, telling John that he was a bitch, saying that he needed to knock Thomas out. She said that she's seen people knock each other out before, so it shouldn't be that hard. So why can't John just buck up and knock Thomas out? She was basically instigating him and egging him on, calling him all sorts of names, trying to get him to just go and hit Thomas some more. Deanna then heard as John headed into the garage, so Deanna ran downstairs to try to stop whatever was about to happen. She told Kelsey to stop, but just as she was doing so, Kelsey ran into the garage to see what was happening. Kelsey then came back into the house and told Deanna that it was too late. Deanna asked Kelsey what she meant, and that is when John came back into the house from the garage now covered in blood and holding a gun. John had blood all over his hands and arms and blood splattered all over his face. It was clear that John had just beaten Thomas with this gun. This was a fact that was confirmed by the medical examiner, stating that whatever killed Thomas was small and cylindrical, similar to the barrel of a gun. Once Deanna saw that, she started panicking and crying, so Kelsey told her to get started cleaning. So, that's what she did. She said at that point, she didn't know what else to do. And I can see how she was in a state of extreme stress and shock. And after seeing the level of violence that these people are capable of, 
I probably would have done whatever they said in that moment too. Either way, it was most likely at that time that John put Thomas's body in the trunk of the car and left him there while they figured out what to do. That night, after witnessing the murder of this 71-year-old man, Deanna stayed at her boyfriend's house along with Kelsey's four-year-old son. The following day, Kelsey and Deanna returned back to the house to continue cleaning. Once again, as I stated before, that is when they started staying at different hotels and got that cleaning crew to clean up the house. At this time, Kelsey told Deanna that the cover story that they would tell for why Thomas was gone was that he returned back to California with some random men that they didn't know, but allowed Kelsey to continue using his bank information to pay for the hotels and pretty much anything else they needed. It also appears that they used Thomas's phone for a few days, once again texting Judy to try to get more bank info out of her, but she knew that it was not Thomas, so she didn't give that information up. Then, once Kelsey and everyone found out about the police poking around the house once again, Kelsey drove her car with Thomas's body in the trunk and then left the car abandoned on the side of a dirt road. Some of the evidence, like I said from before, like the gloves and the cleaning supplies, were also in that car. And then, as we heard from before, there was evidence of a fire in the front passenger seat. Most likely, she tried setting the car on fire to get rid of the evidence, assuming that it would just go up in a blaze, but she obviously did not stick around long enough to make sure that the car actually burned. She then probably got driven back to the hotel by John. I don't know if that's 100% confirmed. I don't know who drove her around that day, but either way, Kelsey returned back to the hotel before contacting a friend to come pick them up and they started heading towards California. Then, as we know, police found the car with Thomas's body. They also found tons of DNA and fingerprints that belonged to Kelsey, John, and Deanna. This led them to the home, which again confirmed a lot of what Deanna had told them, based on the blood evidence that they found. Upon issuing the arrest warrant for John, Kelsey, and Deanna, they were all charged with murder. However, after Deanna turned herself in and spoke with officers about what happened, her charges were reduced to accessory to murder. She said that she only went along with Kelsey and John because she was afraid for her life but she could have reported things a lot sooner than she did, so she accepted that part of her role in this. Meanwhile, both Kelsey and John pleaded not guilty to their murder charges. In the preliminary hearings, Kelsey was seen wearing an oversized prison jumpsuit because she was actually pregnant when she was arrested. While in jail awaiting her trial, she did give birth to her daughter, but I'm not completely sure of what happened with her daughter or her other children for that matter after she gave birth. I'm assuming that John is the father, so obviously the daughter is not in his custody. Her other children are probably with their father, but I don't know, unfortunately, what happened with this new daughter. Deanna testified at the preliminary hearings, though, for everything that she witnessed, and obviously it was clear exactly what happened. Obviously, the defense could just say that Deanna was lying, but it was argued that even if she was not telling the truth, Kelsey couldn't possibly be the one who murdered Thomas because based on where he was hit with the baseball bat and given that Kelsey's size is significantly smaller than Thomas, there was no way that she could have been the one responsible for the physical beating but she did seem to be the one who egged John on, and obviously she took part in everything else that happened, so she definitely had a huge amount of responsibility in this. But by June of 2022, after working with the prosecutors in this case, John Kennison actually pleaded guilty to charges of second-degree murder as well as conspiracy to commit murder. For this, he was sentenced to 18 to a max of 45 years in prison. Then, after working with prosecutors as well, Kelsey also entered a new plea, but she did not plead guilty. She actually entered an Alford plea, which means that she can maintain her stated innocence, but she understands that there is plenty of evidence to convict her on charges of second-degree murder. So basically, she's pleading guilty to second-degree murder, but she is technically able to say that she is maintaining her innocence. 
For this, Kelsey ended up being handed a 25-year prison sentence for the murder of Thomas. Ms. Turner, in accordance with the laws of the state of Nevada, you're hereby judged guilty of second-degree murder, a felony. You're hereby sentenced to 10 to 25 years in the Nevada Department of Corrections. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good luck, Ms. Turner. Court's adjourned. Thank you, Of course, in the aftermath of this, Judy is just heartbroken. She is disgusted that such evil exists in the world. Someone who took advantage of Thomas's kindness for so many years, got so much money out of him, just left him in the back of a trunk to rot after he was brutally, violently beaten to death. Not only that, but she made some of the worst kind of allegations that you can make against someone. To falsely accuse someone of being a child predator is just despicable. And again, there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever to prove that he did anything of the sort. And based on what we do know about Kelsey, I absolutely would not put it past her to make false allegations like that to try and keep the money coming and blackmail him into paying her. Dear Judge Kearney, prior to March 3rd, 2019, I would never have imagined having to make this statement. My entire world was viciously ripped from me with the murder of Thomas K. Bouchard, my fiancé and long-term partner. Since that time, I have suffered unimaginable grief and loss, which has taken its toll on me physically, emotionally, and financially. I was the first to know that something was seriously wrong when he did not get off the plane he was scheduled to fly home on. My immediate thought was to check with his office. I knew that no matter what, he would not just leave his patients without making arrangements. I will always wonder if there was something I could have done to prevent Tom from going to Las Vegas <coughs> to see Kelsey Turner. Tom was under a lot of stress, and I sincerely believe he was in the early stages of Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. She lured him to Las Vegas with some story about how she was sick and couldn't take care of her child and had no money for food or medicine, etc. His last words to me were, she's such a pervasive liar that I had to see for myself. A day does not pass that I am not reminded of Tom and how horribly and painfully he suffered in his final hours on earth at the hands of John Kinnison and Kelsey Turner. I never realized such evil existed in this world until this happened. Physically, it has been very difficult for me. The emo emotional turmoil I have experienced was and is literally gut-wrenching. Prior to Tom's murder, Kelsey Turner had threatened <coughs> violence and even threatened to kill me if I caused her to be evicted. I was in no way responsible for her eviction. The fact that she hadn't paid rent was the reason for eviction. Considering the fact that she was that angry over an eviction, she will be much more angry after having been incarcerated. I also want to mention many other victims of this crime, the silent ones, his patients, who are some of the most vulnerable people and most were children. I can't begin to tell you in the past how many people had come up to us and said, Dr. Burchard, you probably don't remember me, but 20 years ago you saved my life when I had tried to commit suicide. It grieves me to think how many lives have not been saved due to his murder. One of the hardest facts to accept is that Tom was heinously, savagely beaten, literally tortured to death and then callously dumped in the trunk of a car and left abandoned in the desert. But the hardest of all to accept is that from what I have seen, 
Kelsey Turner shows absolutely no remorse and does not accept any responsibility for the murder she committed. Judy expressed fear that if Kelsey is ever released on parole, that she will have to spend her life looking over her shoulder in fear of what Kelsey could do to her. And after seeing what Thomas went through, I absolutely see where she's coming from. He was killed in such a horrendous, brutal way for absolutely no reason. Overall, no matter what you think about Thomas, he obviously didn't deserve this. Kelsey told her friends that he wasn't a sugar daddy, but it kind of seemed like that was the situation here. But even if this was a situation where he was romantically interested in Kelsey, or if he just liked sending her money and spending time with her, it genuinely does not matter. She is a full-grown adult who is clearly taking advantage of him, especially when he started to show signs of dementia. And for whatever reason, he continued to fall for her BS and it's just devastating. My heart breaks for Thomas's loved ones, the patients he helped, and everyone else who knew and loved him. His life is gone so brutally because of someone who fell into a rage for God knows why. Because at this point, we really don't even know why Thomas was killed. We know that an argument happened. We know that John and Kelsey were angry. But Kelsey was the one making threats and spewing accusations, while according to Deanna, Thomas was just trying to calm things down. To me, if there were messages about trying to get Kelsey's kids away from her, that could explain the rage. I think she could have been looking for something to be angry about because she was afraid that Thomas was about to cut her off. I could also see if John was enjoying the life that Thomas financially provided and the threat of that being taken away sent them both into a rage. I guess that makes sense. But with cases like this, of course, the level of violence that people escalate to makes no sense and it is always heartbreaking. But that is all of the information that I have for today's video and now I want to hear what you all think about this wild ride of a case. What do you think Kelsey actually found on that phone and why do you think she got mad? Or do you think she was just looking for a reason to be mad because she was afraid of him cutting her off financially? Why do you think John was so upset? Why do you think Deanna went along with all of it? Do you think she really feared for her life? Also, what do you think of Kelsey's Alfred plea? What do you think of what Judy has been saying about the entire thing? Let me know any and all thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.